Welcome back to the Slanton Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift. Big day and news for Zwift in this pod, so stay tuned for that. What was supposed to be the most boring Vuelta stage shouldn't exist too long this race. Well, it absolutely kicked off. Finishing in Tomares, it's pancake flat. No one bothered to get in the break except, I think, Burgos and Uskatel again. But we had a little uphill drag with 10Ks to go and then a 600-meter punch, 8.3%, 3Ks or so from the finish, descent and then a little punch to the line. Perfect for Mads Pedersen. He is the favorite for the stage. But could Avon Apol be put under pressure by Roglic? Would Roglic throw a haymaker? We'd wait and see. I think I got the stage profile a little bit wrong. I had an outdated one on the rest day recap yesterday. But... Break Benji, was it how do you what's the man's name? Okamika once again. Okamika once again. Yes, indeed. He's doing a lot of uh kilometers in the breakaway. And I think Mate was in there as well today. So two Spanish pro team riders. Now Mate is doing this, I think, every kilometer or something. He's going to try and plant a tree or so it's something like that, okay? I um, don't know the exact uh signification of his plan, but there's something that he's doing for the climate by being in the breakaway. So this breakaway was up there. And when a breakaway like that is up there, we've said it numerous times in this Vuelta, then we know that it's going to be a peloton day because this is controllable. Two riders that are pro team riders, they're not weak riders, but compared to multiple World Tour teams that are going to try and control this stage, like you mentioned yesterday, Trek, for example, we have grows with interest for bike exchange, like plenty of teams that are willing to get something out of this. There's some teams that might not want to chase, but have a rider for this race, like a uh, a Kofidis, for example, with a Kokar. I don't know if I saw them actually chasing. I don't think so. I think it was mainly the team of Trek and so forth. And we also looked into the likes of Ackermann, for example. And he had a team that can't really control because they've got too many GC riders for that aspect. But hey, his break was going to be in control, then it kind of looked like it was going to be your uh, regular siesta stage, right? Getting away um, with a break that is inevitably caught in this stage and the peloton looking like it was going to be a a mass print is a big word for a finish like this but uh action by the peloton itself on the final 15 kilometers right absolutely i'd had a big rest uh big siesta tuned in at 25 k's to go perhaps 15 k's too early there's been a lot of news today though we've mentioned the upcoming changes to zwift including the ability to race your segment personal best and as we've said there's never a better time to start training indoors but today there's one more thing zwift has announced a new smart trainer physical smart trainer too I think it's taken some people by surprise. The Zwift Hub will be on sale from the 3rd of October and Zwift are breaking down the barriers by making this trainer cheaper. So I think 450 USD, like incredibly cheap compared to some of the rivals. But people like, if you check out the videos of GP Lama and DC Rainmaker, etc., cetera, um, who've and sort of had a look at it, first look at it, you can see the price comparisons for yourself. It's also easier to set up than any other trainer on the market there's companion videos they just uploaded a raft of them on the swift youtube channel and it already comes with a good manual etc so it comes pre-installed with a shimano shram or campagnolo cassette of your choice from 8 to 12 speed to sign up for notifications for when the swift hub goes on sale or to find out more about swift and the new smart trainer head swift.com i think it's only available at the moment in the u.s uh and eu and uk uh for now but anyway big news from zwift we're really excited to see that making indoor training more accessible yeah break being caught everyone lines up got this climb nothing <laughs> happens j vine on the left keeping melia in good position poor j vine wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah poor j vine <laughs> and then there was bex i think groves punctured and Ineos were there for rodriguez yumbo pacing with hair sink I couldn't see Avon Paul Benji at all from like 8Ks to go. And you would think he'd want to be in good position before a 700 meter 8% pinch. Yes, certainly. I, I won't lie. I was looking at the teams for like a Peterson and Sethel when it comes to the setup there. And I was also looking at Roglic because he seemed to be trying to get to the front 
when that hill was upcoming on the right side together with Hasing that brought him to the front and then he dropped back a tiny bit to try and sit in the train of I think he was sitting behind one of the Ineos riders or two of the Ineos riders who were also trying to get Rodriguez near the front as well at this point in the race and while well, Hasing was doing his work at the front at that point as well then you're right Evenepoel was nowhere to be seen but I didn't feel like there was an imminent action yet when we started hitting that climb at the bottom. I feel like we started just seeing the group ride at tempo, and then we saw a move on the left side by who? This is a test. Azurmendi from Oiskadi, I think. I that, think it was, yeah. <laughs> that went on fella. the attack on the left side and got a bit of a gap for a tiny bit, but it just looked like the peloton was keeping tempo across the road, very whiff across the road. And then there was a move from a man that, um, that wanted to spice it up today's stage, right? Primoz Roglic not going down without a fight. He slides up the left-hand side, attacks on this 8% pinch. He's got Ackerman who thinks about it, maybe costs him. Ackerman's like, should I follow it? And he's like, actually, he does. He follows, I think, Oliveira, who was in Roglic wheel. They get there. Then Pedersen has to do this. Is, he's going to be sort of not talked about very much in this stage, Mads Pedersen. He has to solo bridge across to Ackerman being pulled by Roglic. Regnko, no, nowhere. Enric Maas, nowhere that we can see. Danny Van Poppel bridges. Fred Wright bridges across. And we suddenly have Primoz Roglic pulling a group of Danny Van Poppel, Mads Pedersen, Pascal Ackerman, and Fred Wright. Absolutely mental. It was like the Grant Thomas, Chris Froome, Sagan, Bodnar thing, but... Like maybe even crazier than that. And I'm thinking, where is Remco Avenapol? And we look back, Remco Avenapol, he's got his hand up, 2.4 Ks to go. It says on the ticker, he must have been with himself within the 3 K section. And he's getting his bike changed, presumably for a mechanical, but we hadn't seen him for a long time. I'll do, I want to get into the discussion about this in a second. He looks calm as a cucumber. Roglic keeps pacing full gas. He know he, all he can see is that he's got a gap on Remco and then basically brings all those other guys to a sprint. He knows he can't beat them. He's just going for time gain. And then Mads Pedersen, they come to a right-hand corner. Uh, Pedersen true to his word, and nature opens it up, absolutely tortures everybody. Ackerman in the world. Ackerman is in good shape, though, I think. Like, he's not just... Yeah. Like, he's not just some scrub, like, right? And he's actually in good shape. Like, oh, but people say he's terrible on UAE, but I actually think mm-hmm. since Polony has been in okay shape, um, Fred Wright and Van Poppel can't get out of, the, out of his wheel. And Roglic, who pulled off, he then wanted to get back into the draft, and we can't see it from helicopter, front on, side on, Maybe a spectator will put it up. There's no clear shot, but from what it seems to me is Rolich tries to get back into the draft. He doesn't account for Fred Wright and just basically chops himself onto Fred Wright and goes down really, really hard. Comes like looks super banged up, like gone down really hard, blood everywhere, elbow gashed open, um, looked dizzy, has to sit down, looks in shock. And then we see even a pole two, three minutes later, cruising over the line, cool as a cucumber, Benji. So we'll talk about, I'll give Pedersen his props in a second, but sorry, GC comes first. What do you, what do you <laughs> make of all this? Could you explain what finish is this? You've dug up the rules of the ASO rules for the Vuelta. Like, let, let's start from there about what this stage is categorized as. Okay, so basically when we look at the top of stage, it's been a mess for a, a bit because I think last year we had a discussion at the start of the Vuelta because the Vuelta started with, if I recall, Arate, the uh, uphill finish, but with a slight downhill to the line over the top on the first stage of the Vuelta. And we noticed in that stage that the three-kilometer rule apparently counted on that stage. We even mentioned that on the podcast. Now... Why would that count on a stage like that? You start questioning, well, it's technically not an uphill finish because the last few hundred meters are downhill. Is that the reason towards it? There was a lot of discussion about that. And I went diving into the ASR rules and credit to you as well because I could not find the singular point where it was standing in those Vuelta rules technically because uh, I don't know if it's the same as the Tour de France rules, but the ASO rules for the Vuelta were stating this exactly where there's kind of a differentiation made be- between like stages that are 
supposed to be mass sprint finishes and stages that are not those mass sprint finishes. And now the question is, what does this count as? And does that actually influence whether the three kilometer rule is being used or not? And it refers in this ASO document that for mass sprint finishes or supposed mass sprint finishes, you can always have situations that and like that Vuelta stage last year where Seneschal ended up winning. That was a supposed mass sprint finish, but Seneschal won because of a weird situation in the last two kilometers. Now, for those rules, a specific UCI rule for those mass sprint finishes counts. A specific set of UCI rules counts for that. Now, when we venture into that, do you see anything related to the three kilometer rule? And do you think it applies to this situation? And next to that, you think that this stage is therefore applied to or not? Well, there's some really sloppy language here because I'm looking <laughs> through the rules. We, we were mass, you know, control effing. I was like, Benji, put in kilometer. No, spell kilometer in full. Put in three. <laughs> we're like looking through this document. Nothing about three kilometers. We might be looking at the wrong document. Um, and I, rem rem I reminded myself, you got to start with the UCI rules. In road races, it's defaulted that the last three kilometers of a road race stage will have the three kilometer rule. Now that is counterintuitive to me because when I think of like the downhill mm -hmm. finishes to Foix, um, they don't have the three kilometer rule. The exception in the UCI rules is finishes that finish at the top of a hill climb. Now did this finish at the top of a hill climb? And then you look at, so then you, that's the commissaire's decision, decision according to the UCI rules. But the riders get told beforehand, and usually that's in this document. And I was reading the stages with expected mass sprint arrivals as being the basic, these are the stages with the three-kilometer rule. But mm -hmm. that might not be the case. And stage 16 is not listed. It's not here. So then we were like, holy shit. Has even a pole and quick step assumed this is a three-kilometer rule stage? when it isn't and he's just cruising across the line at 100 watts and to be honest it's not in this document it finishes does it finish on top of a hill i would say yes it, it does yeah. finish it does finish uphill and there's hills preceding it so the only either either benji this is a monumental fuck up from their car or they were told in the DS meeting very clearly this is a three-kilometer rule stage. And they've shown him in red. I just saw on TV, they showed him in red. Okay, that's a, a good confirmation at least that the race organizers think that he uh, is finishing this stage in red. Now, I want to add on to that. You mentioned that sometimes it's decided on a DS meeting before the stage starts. I think I recall a story, I don't know what year it was, but... I recall talking to Ideas at some point. The Neil Zakoff thing. Something, was it? Well, no, they said to the month after they disqualified Echoff, they said in a yeah. DS meeting that in a different race that the riders could do exactly what Echoff did. Sorry, that might not have been your example. <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty sad, actually, if you think about it. But, uh, now, like, I think it was a different example, but like, still, it remains the same. There's a DS meeting sometimes before stages where they get to he told certain things by the jury that is reflective of that stage that is coming up. Perhaps the teams were told that the three kilometer rule does actually apply on this stage. And then this is all a non-discussion at all. Then all the teams know that. And then they're all fine with that being the case. Otherwise they, I don't know, can they ride if they don't agree that it's a three kilometer rule? They like stand at the start line or will all the rest just ride off without them? What do you expect to happen? <laughs> uh, there's a few things here. First of all, even a pole, you you can't see him with six k's to go. So I have my issues with the three kilometer rule. I don't like it for starters because of BS situations like this. We saw on the Giro made a big difference on one of the stages. Mm -hmm. And has even a pole got the flat? Has he got the flat before the three kilometer rule? Ridden in the bunch to that point, and then put the hand up. Is that that's possible? If you look yeah. at the overhead, there are zero quick step riders with four and a half k's to go in the first fifty. Zero, yeah. I think. Um, maybe he didn't. Maybe he just realised at two point five k's to go and put the hand up. Um, should this even be a three kilometer rule finish? 
I would say not really <laughs> either. I mean, especially on the rules is that shows. I just it's it's weird to me, Benji, seeing a rider mm-hmm. just rolling over three minutes later with Roglic crashing and then pushing himself. I mean, it's just it's just weird, like not to be fighting for the time, regardless for that rule. So I don't know. Aiden Paul. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And well, got lucky and unlucky today. Um, and I also think some really, really weird rules and credit to Roglic for trying. But yeah, what do you think? Should this be a 3K rule stage? i got to be honest, I found it really difficult to judge whether a 3 kilometer rule should exist or not in general. I think in the vacuum, if you don't look at the Roglic part, if you don't look at him, him crashing or him attacking, for example, let's say he just finishes with the peloton in that situation. And Remco indeed has a puncture, whether it's before a three kilometer and rides into it, whatever the three kilometer rule applies from inside or three kilometers because he actually drops from there. It's, it's, it's there in the rules. It can be exploited. It's, it's the case. Now, I find the thing always annoying when races get decided because someone punctures in like the last kilometer or last two kilometers of a stage. But on the other hand, it's part of cycling. So it's like the balance you want to have between the two. It becomes really fucked up when you have a situation like today where everything like happens at the same time. A Remco three kilometer rule, a Roglic three kilometer rule in this stage as well, right? Because he's supposed to be with the front group with Peterson. So it's put back in the time of, the group of Peterson, I think, yeah. I'm pretty sure, at the finish line as well. So not only does it count here for Remco, but also for Roglic in the final kilometer. I don't know what it would look like if both didn't have the three kilometer rule. That would be a, a good thing to look into afterwards. But even if I was on I three know. minutes, he finished yeah. three minutes afterwards. But like. if he knows that there's no three kilometer rule, then he's also not going to sit up, right? I know that's what I, I just I just don't like it just <laughs> viscerally like seeing someone not fighting for the time during the race just because it's an arbitrary that. rule I just just something about it seeing Roglic fighting literally to the point of breaking himself and at the same this is pre crash before the crash Roglic is fighting for every second and Avonpole in the same race is back on a functioning bike and is not is cruising in with McNulty. That is just weird to me. Yes. Um, especially on a stage like this, that is another sprint finish. In a sprint finish, I think there's also the aspect where this rule is kind of made to make sure that there's no GC riders fighting in the bunch during the sprint lead up in the last two kilometers, for example. Even though we sometimes still see that happen. We sometimes still see a Pogac or a Remco, those riders still fighting in the last kilometer to keep themselves in 15, 20 position for something like that. But I think the three kilometer roll is also there so that the GC riders that position themselves towards that three kilometers then take a bit of a step back and let the sprinters take control the majority of the time at the finish. Is that something we're overlooking in this discussion? I think it's weird when you got Pagacha, Roglic, you know, the, the GC guys don't abide by the rules anymore because they can out sprint, especially in welter stages. So yeah. I don't know. It's an off season topic, maybe in full but i'm just i'm just not a fan uh <laughs> to be honest as you can probably tell at this point you know i picked raven to win the race um but roglic animated this race crazy attack incredible work i don't know what the gap was i mean say remco doesn't have a flat he would have been put on eight seconds in the end roglic does gain the eight yeah. seconds on even um but the crash is not worth the eight seconds. That was a heavy crash. He could. He was not moving his right hand. Um, he, the Umbo guys were around. He looked really, really banged up. Obviously, it's too soon to know. He's presumably getting checked out. What's going to happen tomorrow? Yeah. But in terms of this third week, you know, this is really, really tough for for Roglic and and a, and a shame for him. And did you you don't have any view on? You didn't see clearly like. It kind of was his own fault the way he crashed, like slipping back into the draft. I think so as well. Like we, it's funny because like the one helicopter shot we had that I watched was like cutting above exactly where it happened, so I didn't see it from the helicopter shot. I had to get it from the front view, a similar view that you probably judge it at. And from that, I see Roglic going to the left side of the road, going off the front after pacing this group forward the entire time, and then going back into the right and. He stops a tiny bit next to, I think, 
I think the writer in front of right, I don't know if it was, if it was Von Poppel or Ackermann, I think Van, Van Poppel. Poppel. And when moving backwards, he also goes a bit to the right. And I think from what I could tell, I thought he was like, like hitting a shoulder with right or something. Now, Roglic is the one that makes that move to the right. I, I to, the, to the right, get it? To the right. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, terrible. sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I deliver a formal apology. Jesus Jesus wasn't that there that. this time, thankfully yes. for Fred Wright. <laughs> and he still lost the final sprint, so... I mean, just go on this yeah. time, Pearson <laughs> Ackerman Van Poppel, leave the poor fucker alone. Like, I mean, the Hazel Schrader one was bad. We can't get on him for losing, <laughs> losing this one. I do think I've derailed it, but I do think Bahrain should have tried something different on that punchy climb. Like, why aren't they full sending? Like, this guy who climbs way better than mm-hmm. Ackerman and Van Poppel. Um, but yeah, it's it's unfortunate, and we'll see the impact on GC tomorrow. Remco stays in red, one twenty six now ahead of Roglic. No other change in the top ten. The stage I've not really told you yet. Mads Pedersen <laughs> does win ahead of Ackerman. Van Poppel third. Pedersen's got the jersey wrapped up, the points jersey right in fourth. Uh, Pache, <laughs> Pache, <laughs> my boy, in fifth. Battistella sixth, Bullen seventh, Russo eighth, Escara ninth, Vandenberg tenth. Quite an exciting finish. Yeah, Remco's mm. in the red jersey, yeah. and there's going to be lots of discussions about this. I really, I really think when you hear commentary, mm-hmm. and it's not their fault because we just spent 15 minutes after the podcast, <laughs> no, before the podcast, trying to figure it out. Like they got to make this stuff clear that it's a three kilometer rule or not. Yeah, yeah, I think so as well. It needs to be more clear and transparent beforehand for the public as well, because as a viewer, it's important as well to know after the stage finishes, who's actually leading the bloody race. Like, when you're a team, perhaps they know. Perhaps they knew who was going to be in the lead. But as a viewer, it's kind of important for the entertainment purposes of what you're watching that you get to know it as well. And that's why we don't have to wait, hopefully, 20 minutes past a a stage finish to get a photo finish. Like, we want that as soon as possible after the finish. We want to know as soon as possible after the finish who's in the leader's jersey. And, yeah, it shouldn't be have to be deliberated before actually knowing who's still in the lead by that point. But I do want to mention one more thing about today's stage. It's last time we had Peterson win was on a stage with an uphill finish. Today we had Peterson win on a stage with an uphill kind of sprint as well. Both stages, Alperson decided to go all out for Merlier. I think that's a mistake. Who would you like them to go for? Vermeer. That's very difficult, but try a, a, an early attack with a Vermeer, like with a Vine, because Merlier's not making this finish. Man, Merlier is. He's not. I mean, it's tough because ah. you like you could yeah. ascribe to it, be like, oh, he's demotivated because he's going to Quick Step next year. I don't think that's the case. I just think he's. It's what I was saying about you want sprinters to be versatile, like Philipson, because yeah. Philipson makes every finish. Okay, he's going to come second in some of them, but you've got to be in it to win it. And has Melvia contested a sprint? One, he came third or second. He came third in the Groves one uh, that Van Poppel came second in. That's yeah. the only sprint he's contested. And even there, he wasn't really in with a shot of winning. It's been a terrible Vuelta for him. I think so as well. Terrible Vuelta for him. I will say that positioning and bad luck on that one stage with his bike, although the positioning was also terrible in that one, has played a big role in that. Do I say after this Velta, well, Merlier's speed is gone? I don't think so. I think he still has a speed. I think with the right position, he still has that speed. So I don't think he's uh, necessarily suddenly uh, a terrible investment. I, don't, I know you disagree with that, I think. I, I do think Merlier. that a growth is more interesting, but I also don't think that Merlier is suddenly the rider that is never going to win next year. I think he's going to win for a quick Oh, he'll win I think he's going to sure. win big races as well. But it just... Yeah, but I don't know. It's just not his fault. Though. It's not his fault. You know, I think Remco is the second coming of the Messiah, so they should be spending <laughs> all their money on riders around him. So I see any investment in a sprinter who isn't Fabio Jakobsen as pointless because I'm like, well, <laughs> you're taking neither of those two to the Tour de France. So <laughs> Jakobsen is going to do Giro of Vuelta and Remco is going to go to the Tour. So I don't know why you need a second sprinter. Um, that's yeah. the way I look at it. I think, he, of course, he's you know decent rider. Anyway. Lots to talk about and digest. Um, let us know if we've missed something in the rules. We did just do a quick whip around um, before the podcast started, but maybe even there's been a mistake. Maybe even, you know, 
we've discovered something. Wouldn't be the <laughs> no, it might be the first time actually. Anyway, <laughs> tomorrow stage, uh, stage seventeen from Aracena to Monasterio de Tun. 10 to dia, 162Ks. Again, no categorized climbs, just rolling uh, hills. Ugh, Roglic for sure would have gone for this stage. He would have attacked. Uh, you know, if he's attacking on today's stage, he would have attacked on this. But after the crash, we might be deprived yeah. of that entertainment, unfortunately. Very big shame. Finishes 9Ks, 5%. Last 4Ks is 7.5%. No three kilometer rule, I can safely say, I think, for that. And um, I think it's break. Now that Yumbo won't pace, I'm assuming. Well, firstly, I hope that Roglic actually properly starts the stage with good enough form still, because that hit was pretty hard and he seemed a bit dazed after the finish line. So let's hope he's fine for the coming stage, because otherwise that's a big hit to the last week of this Velta. But um, God damn it, I think it's break as well because of that. You know, like four point one kilometers, seven point five percent, two point three seven percent. Magnus Core not... would have won this from the break last year. <laughs> not, not even joking, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think who's going to pace? Like Quick Step, that no. would be the most oh. <laughs> stupid thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. uh, Trek, no. Quick Step, um, I already said them. Yumbo Visma, I think very unlikely. Movistar, mm, no. Ayuso, I actually do like on this, but I don't think UAE will. So I'm just seeing, seeing breakaway. Can I say your man, Quentin Pache, get in the break? You're cleaning it up. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of sprinter now. Please get in the break <laughs> with Rudy Millard. Um, or, yeah, I'm trying to look through any. Fred Wright, the poor guy. <laughs> he's he's going to get in and get worked over, probably Fred Wright. Um, Padun, maybe. I don't know what the weather is. Uh, who else? De Gent, he's not done too much. Soler will definitely be in the break. So that's UAE in the break for sure with Kenny. Uh, Tiberi's not bad on this sort of thing either, as well as Mark Donovan, Brenner, Aaron. Nice, no, two plus in DC. That's incorrect. Uh, Jay Vine could also win from the breakaway um, or Armirel. But I'm going with Quentin Pache. I'm going to wing it towards someone like Mark Soler or something because uh, I feel like yeah, he's trying Soler's to go nice. in the breakaway almost every day. So there's like some safety in that one. And. Um, there's also the aspect of like, I'm trying to look for those riders that are good enough at climbing, but also punchy at the finish line. Like, I was going to go for Rudy Molara as, as, like, as like a name to mention for that specific rider, but he's not at the level necessarily to win from a breakaway, I'd, I'd say at this point. So I'm also pointing towards uh, a Solero or a, or a Tarame, but I've said this name a few times and he got second that one time. He looks to be in decent form. I'm going to s- not switch and I'm going to stay with Solero. I'm going to regret yeah. that. Who were the guys in that breakaway, the huge one where Fred Wright got worked over? It's like Impy. Was Jake Stella? Stewart in this race? And now he's at Tour of Britain? I'm so, uh, as Oh, yeah, well. you're right. Yeah, there's that, those sort of guys that were in that break. But yeah, Pache is not as good at getting in the break. But mm-hmm. yeah, I'm going to go with him. Anyway. Stay tuned for the news of Roglic. Uh, that'll be coming across maybe tomorrow morning. Hopefully he's okay. He's not broken anything. Poor guy's crashed so much in the last two years. And particularly when he, we did a whole rest day recap yesterday saying how this belt was over, the third week would be boring, and he just threw that back in our face for a brief two minutes and just like that, it kind of fell. It literally fell down. So real shame. Hope he's all right. Avon Paul in red, and um, probably a break tomorrow. Check out the Zwift materials and the announcement. Read the Zwift Hub. Um, plenty of YouTube videos about it as well. And we'll see you with a recap tomorrow. Ciao.